Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the government shutdown on everyone's mind, the impact far reaching. A new report from a prestigious commission recommends a monumental shift in diet and sets off a debate in the process. It's called stockmanship, otherwise known as low stress cattle handling. And a nonprofit grocery store where the only employees are students. Farm Week starts right now. everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. Good to be back with you. Of course, the government shut down on everybody's mind, regardless of when it ends. The longest shutdown in American history leaving its mark. Leighton will have more in his market report, but lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are weighing in with their own plans, though there is no clear end to the stalemate. Meanwhile, increasing pressure on farmers and ranchers, many federal employees working without pay. At the same time, the head of the FDA, Scott Gottlieb, tweeted his concern for those federal workers. He said to them, quote, I know that as this shutdown continues, the personal impacts on you are mounting. I also know that the promise of back pay doesn't erase current hardships. He continued saying, quote, this is a moment of challenge for the FDA. The public is confused about the nutritional value of plant-based products labeled with the word milk. So says the dairy industry, which published new polling data hoping to inspire new government regulation of what it calls fake milk labeling. According to the National Milk Producers Federation, for example, 73% of consumers believe that almond-based drinks have as much or more protein per serving than milk, even though milk has eight times more. With only days to go before the end of the FDA's public comment period on the issue, the Federation says that only one in five consumers believe that plant-based beverages should be called milk. The Federation says fake milk labeling is misleading and is urging the FDA to take action. Is China caving to pressure from President Trump's trade tariffs? Bloomberg is reporting that China is offering to import an additional $1 trillion in U.S. goods over the next six years. Politico reports that analysts close to the trade negotiations are saying, quote, it would be nearly impossible for U.S. production to meet such a massive increase in demand. Meanwhile, the 90-day U.S. tariff truce with the China continues. And finally, in the Farm Week Newswire, the EU, in preparation for upcoming trade talks with the U.S., has released an agenda for those talks that excludes agriculture altogether. That tactic seems puzzling to negotiators who now wonder if ag trade will be up for negotiation outside the talks as agreed last July. Meanwhile, just days ago, the National Pork Producers Council and other ag, U.S. ag groups said it can't support any trade agreement with the EU that doesn't include agriculture. A major report just released by a well-credentialed commission says the world must switch almost entirely away from red meat and sugar to a plant-based diet or risk a breakdown in the world's food production system. That's the basis for what the Eat Lancet Commission, which includes 19 commissioners and 18 co-authors from 16 countries, calls what it hopes will be the great food transformation. The co-chairman of that commission is Dr. Walter Ouellette of Harvard University. In part, the commission says, quote, unhealthy diets pose a greater risk to morbidity and mortality than does unsafe sex and alcohol, drug, and tobacco use combined. Overconsumption of unhealthy foods is increasing because food systems are a major driver of poor health and environmental degradation. Global efforts are urgently needed to collectively transform diets and food production. The commission says world diets are linked to Earth's ecosystem and that's a switch to plant-based diet could, could save more than 11 million lives a year. 
As you might imagine, meat producers are reacting. The North American Meat Institute wrote on its website, quote, the Eat Lancet Commission's recommendations differ dramatically from consensus nutrition science and U.S. dietary guidance. Americans consume the recommended amount of meat and poultry which provide nutrition that cannot be replaced by another food. In fact, the report's fad diet approach that recommends people radically reduce or even eliminate meat from their diets could have substantial damaging public health consequences. The National Pork Producers chimed in on its website with this. The Eat Lancet report issued today calling for drastic court, uh, cuts in meat, dairy and egg consumption to promote a healthier diet and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is based on dubious science and is irresponsible. While two of the report's concerns are sustainability and undernutrition, its radical recommendations would be counterproductive to both. The Commission says food production is the largest cause of global environmental change and is planning 35 launch events around the world, including the U.S., Norway, Belgium, Australia, Thailand, and many others. If you'd like to read the report yourself, Google Eat Lancet, L-A-N-C-E-T, report. You can download the 50-page report and see the research for yourself. Cattle owners who dread working their herd or are simply looking to increase efficiency in their operations may need to consider something called low stress handling. Research shows it can improve both animal performance and health. Recently, a Montana man explained the idea to some Mid-South producers. It's not a horse show, cattle auction, or rodeo going on here. You might say it's like a cow whisperer at work. Kurt Pate is demonstrating low-stress cattle handling, a technique officially known as stockmanship. The stockman, he doesn't care if he's a foot, a horseback, or on a four-wheeler. He puts the right pressure on the animal at the right time. The key is, is proper pressure. And it doesn't matter if you're in a helicopter, on foot, or on a horse or a four-wheeler. It's, it's got to be proper. Or the cow doesn't understand it, and then it doesn't work as good. Pate operates under the adage, slower is faster when working cattle. Cattle are only pressured from the side, behind the point of their shoulder, and only when they see where they are to go. You know, it's amazing to see some of the things that you can do whenever you slow down and think about how that animal is going to respond to that pressure. You know, when they can get those cattle to go through a hole about this big, it seems like that's pretty impressive when the arena is as big as it is. Working cattle through a chute does have a negative effect, even with low stress handling but it is necessary in order to apply some health procedures. Overall, Kurt Pace says good stockmen are students of their cattle and concerned with the whole life of their animals. He thinks the Mid-South and Southeast rank higher in stockmanship than other areas of the country. I find people in the South usually work cattle a little slower and easier than some other places. I don't know if it's because of the humidity or not. We understand what money is here and what producing livestock for, for profit and good stockmanship, slow, good stockmanship creates profit. For more information on stockmanship philosophies, visit online at KurtPageStockmanship.com. In gardening, of course, these winter months can be especially challenging for those with cabin fever hoping to get outside and get a head start on decorating their yards. But horticulturist Gary Bachman says, fear not. You can use the thriller, filler, and spiller method to wind up with some easy outdoor eye candy. What is that, you ask? Here's Gary with the answer. In the winter months, you can still be creative with attractive containers for your front porch, and in most cases, the material is free. I'm going to use the tried and true Thriller, Filler, and Spiller recipe. To get started, I'll collect plant material from the grounds at Coastal Research and Extension Center. All of the branches and materials should be about three feet long. We can always trim them back. For the Thriller, I'm choosing these long crepe myrtle branches with last season's seed pods. To add a dramatic touch, I'm going to spray paint these white and gold. For the fillers, let's select some southern magnolia branches. It's appropriate that the state tree of Mississippi anchors the arrangement. I also want to add bunches of the Mississippi native eastern red cedar 
as finer textured filler material. For the spillers, I'm choosing the Weeping Yopan Holly. These will sprawl out over the container edge and display those gorgeous translucent bright red berries. Now let's put the arrangement together using this old galvanized florist can that has the look of being well weathered. The arrangement should be in proportion to the container. For this arrangement, I'm keeping the height about two times as tall as the florist can. Now I think the best part of having a winter arrangement is you don't have to remember to water it. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Time now for the markets with Layton and talk about a thriller. How about trying to make commodity and crop decisions without enough information? Isn't that the truth? And that's exactly, <laughs> Mike, what's been going on since this government shutdown began. Traders and producers, well, they're operating in a data vacuum without all the usual USDA reports now. Meanwhile, the corn-based ethanol market is losing horsepower. You'll find out why. And we'll hear some optimism about the live cattle market. Grain market analyst Bryce Knorr of Farm Futures Magazine says the continuing lack of USDA reports is causing trading in most markets to be fairly choppy. Trader Darren Newsom thinks the current situation will expedite a move towards the crop data already being generated by the multitude of private firms already out there. Each one of these trading firms use private research data and information. And I think what we're going to see is a move away from the public, from the government, USDA, EIA, and all of these things. And we're going to go back towards, or we're going to move towards the private sector where you've got different companies. You've got all kinds of research companies doing all kinds of things uh, using the latest in technology, something USDA simply doesn't do. Uh, and that's where they're going to get the information. And that's going to be the data that they plug into these programs. And that's what's going to drive trade, drive markets, is the actual data. Meanwhile, the U.S. Rice Producers Association reports there have only been minor changes in rice prices the last 10 days. Association Executive Dwight Roberts says this market itself is essentially operating blind right now as far as crop projections and export volumes. Roberts thinks the trade is taking the setbacks, though, in stride and that rice business continues despite the lack of USDA data. Meanwhile, all is not so well in the corn-based ethanol industry these days. Here in Mississippi, the Ergon Biofuels ethanol plant in Vicksburg closed down last month. The company cites underperforming production equipment as well as the cost of bringing in corn from other states as reasons for that decision. Meanwhile, nationwide, the ethanol industry is facing large supplies, tight margins, and not enough demand. Trader Elaine Cove explains. Ethanol right now is a struggling part of the corn market. Uh, you're looking at ethanol plants might be projecting a 20 cent per gallon loss right now, some of them. And you have seen our Bob gasoline prices, you know, come down 33 percent during the month of November, just like crude oil. So that's really the energy side of the market is weighing on corn prices right now rather than being a benefit. There has been this encouragement of getting OPEC to produce more oil, but at some point I feel that's not helpful to the U.S. economy because actually the U.S. is the number one producer of oil in the world. And this, this week, oil prices, the nearby WTI, went below $50 per barrel. And that's sort of the magic number where it starts to be unprofitable for the Permian Basin or the Bakken Formation to still be pumping. So it could get too far where it's, it's perhaps helpful for consumers, but mm -hmm. not necessarily helpful for the overall economy. Well, let's now check out your livestock knowledge with our trivia quiz for this week. And here is the question. What is the meat of a sheep in its first year called? Is the answer A, mutton, B, hogget, C, veal, or D, lamb? We'll have that answer coming up for you on Farm Week. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, it's an unusual story about a nonprofit grocery store, a joint project between a small town in Cody, Nebraska, and a school district. The students are the only paid employees, and they get class credit. This business model is sustainable in a people-centric way, and you don't have to drive cross-country for groceries. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away.
Mississippi 4-H celebrates a rich history of youth development through creative hands-on experiences. Programs emphasize leadership, technology, science, and agriculture. But it's a lot more than that. making the best better. Before we get back to our market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, on January 29th and 30th at the Lake Terrace Convention Center in Hattiesburg, it's the Mississippi Peanut Growers Association 14th Annual Meeting and Trade Show. The MPGA is organized and operated for educational and scientific purposes. For more information about the conference, call Dr. Malcolm Broom at 601-606-3500. 47. And on February 5th and 6th at the Bost Extension Center at Mississippi State University in Starkville, it's the 46th Annual Mississippi Agricultural Consultants Conference. The conference begins at 8 a.m. on the 5th and your registration fee includes lunch. License renewal is available at the conference. The fee is $80 at the door. You can register for $65 online until January 28th. For more information, visit online at msagconsultants.com. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. What is one of the best markets in agriculture for 2019? It's open to discussion, of course, but there are economists and analysts who will quickly tell you it's the live cattle market. Sue Martin is one who shares this positive opinion of beef. She explains why. Our indicators that we follow, we have three that we absolutely love and put a lot of faith in, are turning negative. And those, one of them's a weekly, uh, on the weekly time frames. And so that's gonna take some time to get those to be fully cleaned out. Once we get them cleaned out, I think we're gonna be on a mission starting for the April contract, mm -hmm. maybe in March, and then moving higher into, into April. I love the summer months. And I will say this, and I know this sounds crazy, but a year ending in a nine on cattle, I went back to 1959. I took cash markets for 1959 and 1969, and both of those years showed a higher closing at the end of the year than the year before. From 1979, on through 2009, every one of them closed higher than the year before on the futures. So I think underground that says you've got support under the market. Meanwhile, the hog sector is another area of livestock that appears to be holding support here in the new year. There are some questions, though, why the U.S. market for hogs is not taking off more with what the spreading swine fever outbreak in China is going. However, analyst Aaron Newsom is not overly worried in the near term about this market's direction. We've got solid demand. It seems to come in waves and die down a little bit and then the prices fall. I think we're still gonna be okay. I'm not a huge hog bull, but I do think the market can continue to stay at least firm in here. I think the cash market's gonna to continue to hold the support. Back to our trivia question now to wrap things up in the markets for yet another week. Let's see if you are correct with what you picked. What is the meat of a sheep in its first year called? The answer is D, lamb. Mutton, if you're curious, is the term for the meat of an adult sheep. For those living and working in rural America, it might be a fur piece, as some might say, maybe an hour or more to get meat and vegetables they might need for a hot meal, especially if they're not already raising those ingredients themselves. But one Midwestern community has found a way to cut the travel time from grocery store to dinner table. Here's Peter Tubbs. The weekly grocery delivery from North Platte has arrived at the Circle C Market in Cody, Nebraska. Six students from Cody Kilgore High School help unload the shipment and stock the shelves and coolers. These students are the only employees paid by the market, which is part of why a village of 150 residents can support a grocery store. 
We try to get all of our groceries in Cody as much as we can um, because we know that the store is important to the town and we know that we appreciate it being here and if, if the store wasn't here, we might not have the opportunity to live here. The small supermarket is a nonprofit. More significantly, it is a joint project between the village of Cody and the Cody Kilgore School District. The business teacher at the high school oversees the store in addition to her teaching duties, while the students perform the majority of labor and management jobs. I stock shelves, I deface shelves, I check people out, I make sure the store is presentable, dusting, defacing, really just helping out. Students earn a paycheck for each hour worked, as well as academic credit hours. But responsibility for managing is handed to anyone who is ready for the burden. Bentley Jenkins is the current purchasing manager and also programmed the point of sale system that is used to check out groceries. It's kind of hard. In our point of sale system, we don't have the inventory totally up to date yet. So we can't just print off and then go from ordering there. For ordering, we have to walk around the store, see what we need and kind of guess. So it's a little tricky. While the selection at the Circle C can't compare to a full service grocery store, the time savings justify choosing from the limited selection. Well, if the store weren't here, I would have to drive to Valentine once a week and get groceries. It's about 38 miles to drive there and, and then load up on everything and just the storage and planning for all that would be pretty um, hard with little ones. The majority of groceries arrive on Thursdays in time for households to stock up for the weekend. The 63 students of the Cody Kilgore School District are on a Monday to Thursday calendar, which saves on transportation costs for the district and frees students for ranch work on Fridays. But the lessons learned on the job extend past the basics of business. I'm really learning people skills because I don't really like talk to people very often unless I'm working because then you have to be nice and all that which I'm not very good at. <laughs> the 480 residents of the school district are spread across 550 square miles, making it one of the least densely populated districts in the state. The Circle C is the result of a volunteer effort begun in 2008 to return a retail food outlet to Cody, which had been without a local grocery store since 1995. The market has purchased much of its infrastructure used one cooler and the checkout stand came from a store in Valentine that was closing. Other coolers and shelving came from another store in Valentine that was remodeling. A USDA grant funded the initial construction of the store, which was built using straw bale techniques that date back to the 19th century Nebraska Prairie. The straw walls are thick, but also energy efficient. The store uses $600 to $800 per month in electricity. Almost all goes to running the large coolers. Under its present structure, the store is sustainable month to month and has become a community hub where neighbors meet for a few minutes out of their day. The best job is probably checking people out, helping them. You know, it's community members that I've grown up with and it's fun to help them out and see them around town. You've got to have a bank. You need a grocery store. You need a school to start with. And, you know, we've got all of those now and we just got some young people becoming more involved. And you know, a small town like this, you're either surviving or you're dying. Because you know, you need to be town of destination, not one of stopover. Summer reduces the sales volume by 50% as residents make fewer trips into Cody. Many households have second homes in town for the school year, with the primary home on a ranch elsewhere in Cherry County. Commutes of 50 miles or more are common in northern Nebraska, and many households have planned meals a week or a month at a time due to the effort needed to buy groceries. The Circle C provides the luxury of only having to plan out a few days. Groceries are priced 35% over their wholesale cost, which is still competitive with stores in Valentine. But while the store pays students $30,000 annually for hours worked, those margins won't cover the salary of an owner or manager. Circle C only survives as a non-profit educational project. Cody lacks the population to support a for-profit store. Non-profit status allows spending in other areas, 
like college scholarships for student employees tied to the number of hours worked in their high school career. Scholarships can reach $600 per semester, but sometimes students have to warm up to the job. At first, when I was hired, I did not want to do this job. My, my parents forced me <laughs> to have it. They're like, it'll be a good experience for you because my older brother, he was the student manager his last year of high school. So I was like, I'm going to hate it. I don't want to do it. I ended up loving it. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, I think. That was Peter Tubbs reporting. And what did they say? Necessity is a mother of invention? Exactly, Mike. <laughs> and uh, it's good to see those kids helping out and, of course, making a little pocket change along the way, too. Absolutely. Good story. Well, next week, Farm Week has another way to make food available. We're calling it Gardening for Good. Before the president's signature was even dry on the new Farm Bill, USDA officials considered provisions cut from the original bill. Strengthening SNAP work rules was a big part of that goal, but big picture, food insecurity impacts millions of Americans. We'll talk to one farmer doing his part to provide fresh produce in the land of tall corn. That's next time on Farm Week. And remember, if you missed a story, look for the past episodes of Farm Week at our website, farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. By the way, late word, the USDA is planning to reopen FSA offices for two weeks. Those employees will be working without pay while they process dairy and trade relief payments. Look for more on my blog at farmweek.tv and on Facebook. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.